Um, I have a, a proposition for you. Um, Bob Pomeranke mentioned last week that it might be a good idea because it's 117 degrees out there by the time we get out of church um, to move the, the church service to 8.30 in the morning for the summer schedule instead of 10.30. I brought it up to the leadership team and they said, let's pull the people who are actually there on Sunday morning and see what they think. So what do you think? Shall we do a show of hands? All in favor of moving church services to 8.30 Sunday morning instead of 10.30, raise your hand. <laughs> okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How many would say, no, that's too early? It's to keep it to ten thirty. One, two, three. <laughs> the people who are actually doing the <laughs> the sound system and the, the video and all that are saying, No, too early. Ask us about nine thirty. Okay. What about nine thirty? Would that be better? Nine o'clock? Okay. What are you going to do with Bible study? Yeah, that's the question. Would have Bible study either before or after? So what are we gaining? Good question. There's church service and that Bible study around, but you're not gaining anything. We just switch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let's see. Maybe we better make it a majority thing. Eight thirty, nine, nine thirty. Three options. Okay. How many say eight thirty? One, two, three, four. How many say nine? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many say nine thirty? How many say 9.30? One? Hmm. Seems like 9 o'clock is the, is the, the highest. Uh. <clears throat> okay, so would anybody really have a problem with 9 o'clock for church service? Okay. Better than 10.30. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's an hour and a half difference as far as the as the uh, service goes. We can determine that, yeah. Bible study. Pardon me? Mm. Well, we need to let people know so they can come in a week. Yeah. Nine. Okay. I don't think we're gaining anything. I think it's because we're more confused to people that aren't here every week when we start changing it. True. But I we do have a few people that come here a little bit late on Sunday, too. If we just switch church and Bible study, then those who want to stay for Bible study can stay for Bible study at 1030. And we can have church at 9. Okay. Church at 9, Bible study at 10. 10, 15. Or as soon as as soon after church as we can get it together, <laughs> ten 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 fifteen. That work. Yeah. The Bible study is more like thirty to forty minutes rather than an hour, so we'd be getting out a little earlier good. for everything. Okay. So church will begin at nine o'clock starting next Sunday. Mm-hmm. Right. All right. Are there any other announcements that I have forgotten to make? No? Good. Then let's say hello to everybody.
Some thank the Lord for friends and home, for mercy sure and sweet. But I would praise Him for His grace, prayer I would repeat. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. Some thank him for the flowers that grow, for some the stars that shine. My heart is filled with joy and praise because I know he's mine. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. I trust in him from day to day, I prove his saving grace. I sing this song of praise to him until I see his face. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me. Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us here today. We've gathered in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray that you would open our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that in the preaching of your word, we would come to trust in Jesus in life and in death, to repent of our sins and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Joined heirs of Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been lost in the fountain. Cleansed by, by his, his blood, blood. Joy to Jesus, Jesus as we travel the side. I'm part of the family, the family of God. From the door of an orphanage to the house of the king, no more longer an outcast, new song I sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not, I'm not worthy, worthy to, to be here, here but praise God, God I belong. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join the days of Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings in them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings in them one by one. Count your blessings. God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count 
and so many blessings see what God has done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. When you look at others with their lands and gold, Christ has promised you his love untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy. Your reward in heaven or your home on high. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings. Angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Let's bounce back to the psalm, Alex. I'm sorry we messed up the order here. There's a psalm to read together. This is, uh, I heard a guy on the radio say, Welcome to the hour delightfully devoid of professionalism. (laughs) I've been a pastor for 35 years, and it doesn't get any better. (laughs) I still mess up the order of events on the worship service. Let's read together. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Now we'll go to the confessions of sins, uh, Alex. (laughs) Click, 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 click. Here we go. Let's bow before the Lord and confess our sins. Heavenly Father, we come before you to seek your mercy and grace. We have sinned against you and against ourselves with our wrong attitudes of selfishness and pride. We have not completely obeyed your word and have at times even rebelled against your ways. We are sorry. We seek your forgiveness and cleansing through your Son, Jesus Christ, to whom all praise and glory will be given. In his name, amen. (coughs) Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. 
To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become children of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. Amen. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. We looked this one up in the Sunday school class, and people had to look it up. <laughs> 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have brought us here to this place today. We thank you, Lord, for all those who are joining us over the Internet and who will join us in the coming days. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for the privilege of drawing near to you and hearing your voice. Lord, you know what's going on in each of our lives, and so we lift up before you those who are suffering and with illness of one kind or another, we thank you, Lord, for having your hand on us and keeping us safe from this virus that's raging around the world. We thank you, Lord, for healing those who have been sick with it. We thank you, Lord, for those who have been going through surgery just in the last couple of weeks. And we thank you for them and pray for your healing hand on them to continue. Be with Carol James in the hospital right now heal her of the infection in her leg and, and see to it that her pacemaker works the way it should. We thank you, Lord, for Yvonne Olson, and we pray that you'd be with her and give her your healing and your strength. Thank you, Lord, for Sue Olson and for the successful surgery she had. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us as we draw near to you, that you'd open our eyes to understand what you're doing in our lives. Give us understanding of your word. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd give us wisdom as parents and grandparents and as brothers and sisters, as citizens, in all the ways that you've called us to be your servants. Help us to serve you faithfully according to your word. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. We'll bring our offerings to the Lord. Again, the plate has been on the table in the back as you came in. If you missed it, it'll, there'll be a plate there on the way out. If you're joining us online, you can go to calvaryfreelutheran.org and click on the button that says online donation. Thank you, Bob. And worship the Lord together with us in our tithes and offerings. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you that in your mercy you have been faithful to your promise to us to meet our needs as a heavenly father. Thank you for your love for your children that never ends. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving our sins and accepting us. And Lord, in gratitude and in faith, we bring these offerings to you. We pray that you'd receive them and bless them and use them for the extension of your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading today is in Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 17. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 17. The Lord Jesus is speaking. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Here ends our 
gospel reading this morning. We respond to the word of God by confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Would you like to stand as we say the creed together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please take your seats. I should probably clarify when I said an hour delightfully devoid of professionalism, I didn't mean Ross. <laughs> Ross is a professional musician. <laughs> Unlike some of us. <laughs> Let's look at those verses that we just read again. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord Jesus is clarifying a misunderstanding about his preaching and teaching that actually persists to this very day. What he says here is, is very much like what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, verse 31, which we had in our Bible class on Wednesday night just recently. Do we then uphold the law by, do, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means, on the contrary, we uphold the law. You might have noticed that I'm preaching on the, from the gospel reading each Sunday. There's a reason for that. There are three readings for each Sunday of the year by tradition. We call it a pericope which is a Latin word that means to walk around. And so pericope is a walk around the Bible. Uh, the idea is that if you use these traditional readings each Sunday over the course of about eight years, you get a pretty good idea of the whole Bible. You kind of walk through the whole Bible. The Old Testament lesson takes two years to repeat the cycle. And the epistle lesson and the gospel lesson repeat on a three-year cycle. So it's, it's a different combination almost every Sunday. And over the years, I, I usually take two years to preach on the Old Testament lesson every Sunday, and three years to preach on the Epistle lesson every Sunday, and then for the next three years I preach on the Gospel lesson every Sunday. And that's what I'm doing this year. There are exceptions when the Lord leads me to uh, focus on a particular theme for several Sundays or one Sunday in particular. Uh, but I usually stick to this plan because one of the reasons for having these traditional readings is to avoid having preachers ride a hobby horse every Sunday and not get the whole Bible or most of it covered over the years. It's easy to develop a favorite theme and, and only preach that. So this year I'm preaching on the gospel lesson each Sunday, and today's gospel reading is the one we just read in Matthew chapter 5. I find preaching from the gospel reading each Sunday a real challenge, because the gospels are pretty heavy on teaching the law, rather than the gospel. And today's reading is a good example of that. As we have discussed many times here, the doctrinal contents of the Bible are separated into two parts, the law and the gospel. Uh, St. Augustine wrote about this back about 400 AD, and since Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk, he was 
profoundly steeped in the teachings of St. Augustine. And so we, this understanding is especially clear in, in Lutheran theology, although all Christian churches teach it. In some churches, the distinction is maintained almost by accident with no conscious effort on the part of the teacher or the preacher. And in others, there's an effort made to maintain the distinction. But nevertheless, all Christian preaching and teaching does this. Um, I think it, since it's so overtly taught in classical Lutheran theology, the Lutheran churches, at least the ones that are still actually teaching the Bible, uh, do the best job of it, but that's just my personal opinion and I might be a little bit prejudiced. Uh, when we talk about the distinction between law and gospel, we mean that the law is that part of God's word that reveals to us what God demands of us, what he requires of us, what he requires that we do, what he requires that we avoid doing. Thou shalt not murder, for example. We're supposed to avoid murdering and so on. The attitudes that he requires in us, it reveals what he requires that we be, what kind of people he requires that we be. And it also includes the parts where God reveals the consequences for those who fail to meet God's requirements and also the blessings that he promises to those who keep them. That's the law. Some people are thinking, what's left? Right? The gospel, on the other hand, the other great doctrine of the Bible that we call the gospel is that part of God's word where he reveals to us not what he demands of us, but what he has done for us in Christ and all the benefits and blessings that come to us through that. The law makes demands. The gospel doesn't make any demands at all. It gives us everything as a gift. The law promises blessings, but these blessings are always conditional. If we keep God's law, then God will bless us in such and such a way. But if not, there's literally hell to pay. The law promises blessings, but they're always conditional. Do this and you will live. The law threatens. The gospel never threatens. A lot of people think that the Old Testament is all law and the New Testament is all gospel, but that's not true at all. The New Testament preaches the law and actually applies it if possible, more rigorously than the Old Testament in many ways. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in particular, are really harsh sometimes in their preaching of the law. The Lord says things like, You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that any man who looks at a woman with lust in his heart, in his heart has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Or he says, Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. In other words, the New Testament shows even more clearly than the Old Testament how the law applies not just to our outward behavior, but even to the thoughts and feelings in our minds and hearts and condemns us because of our thoughts and feelings which are not pure and often seem to be not very much under our own control. And so preaching through the Gospels becomes a challenge because as a preacher of the Gospel, I want to preach the Gospel as the main thing. The law in its proper place in support of the Gospel, I want to major in the Gospel, not the law. Now look at the verses that we just read. Where is the gospel in these verses? They are pure, 
unadulterated, unrelenting law. In fact, the next verse after these verses says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and Pharisees were, they were the most, the, the biggest sticklers for the law of God that there ever were. So Jesus preaches the law in the Sermon on the Mount, which of course leads us to the question, what is the purpose of the law? The entire Bible is intended to bring us to salvation, of course. And so the purpose of the law is to bring us to salvation. But as we have seen often here, it fails to do that successfully because it demands perfect obedience and we're not perfect and so it ends up condemning us because its promises of blessings and even salvation are conditional and we don't meet the conditions do this and you will live so here's the proper use of the law there are three proper ways to use or apply the law of God. That part of his word that tells us what God requires. The first use of the law is described as a curb, which means a horse's bit. The bit you put into a horse's mouth so that you can jerk on the reins and pull his head around to get him to go the direction you want him to go. Just as you guide a horse with the reins, and you, God uses his law in this sense to set limits on the evil that men are able to commit before either God intervenes or he simply allows the natural consequences of our misbehavior to kick in and punish us. Like a curb or a bit in the mouth of a horse, God is able to pull our heads around either as individuals or as a society and keep us from destroying ourselves and everyone around us as through the preaching of his law. The human conscience is one example of God working through his law in this way as it's informed by God's law so that it reminds us to fear God's wrath so that we don't just go headlong into sin realizing that there are consequences. That's one use of the law of God. The second use of God's law is described as a mirror to show us our sin. Like a mirror that you stagger into the bathroom if you're like me, you know, finish your exercises and you go limping into the bathroom and you turn on the light and you look in the mirror and you're, the mirror will tell you um, you need to comb your hair, you need to wash your face, you need to trim your beard. When we look at the law of God, it shows us what's wrong with our life and what needs to be fixed. But like the mirror, it only shows us what's wrong, it doesn't fix it for us. James chapter 1 it says, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forget what he, forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer but who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So again, we see the law shows us our sin, but it doesn't fix it. It calls us to fix it and says that if we do this, then God will bless us. That's the law. We can go away after hearing God's law and forget what we saw in our own hearts without fixing anything, or we can go away feeling really bad about everything that's wrong or we can keep looking at it and wishing that we could do something about it. 
but it's up to us to fix it. The law doesn't do that for us. It just points our sin out. The real purpose of this second use of the law is to make us aware of our need of a Savior. When we see our sin and the Holy Spirit applies his law to our hearts so that we understand how serious a thing that sin is, then we realize that we can never do enough to save ourselves and our hearts are convicted. Not only of our need to do what's right, but of our need to be forgiven. And so in this sense, the law of God is intended to prepare us to hear the other doctrine in his word, the gospel. And there we learn that we have a savior and that he has already paid for our sin and offers us forgiveness purely by his grace. He has fulfilled the law for us and his perfect righteousness is given to us so that as far as God is concerned, you and I have never sinned. We're like his holy son, Jesus, in God's eyes. That's the gospel. When the law has done this work and we flee for salvation to Jesus, trust in him and are forgiven, born again, set apart for God and saved, we then naturally start wondering how we should live now that we have been made children of God. That brings us to the third use of the law. The third use of the law is described as a ruler or a yardstick. Is God showing us how he wants us to live now that I am his own beloved forgiven child? How should I live? When you want to draw a straight line on a piece of paper, you lay a ruler down on the piece of paper and you just Follow the ruler, and you'll draw a straight line. The law of God now shows us what fruits our faith should bear as we live in this life, forgiven, saved, restored to fellowship with God. We have been made a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a special people set apart for God. How do people who are in that category live? So the third use of the law there's no condemnation. There's no longer any threat because we have already been forgiven and cleansed of all of our sins and guilt. We just want to know how to draw straight lines. We just want to know what the Christian life should look like. And God's law shows us that. So the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. There's no condemnation now in Jesus when we go to the law in its third use. And as we read the Sermon on the Mount, we see that the Lord saw that some people were thinking he was doing away with the moral law of the Old Testament because he was talking about people being just forgiven without earning it. Which would mean that once you believe in Jesus, anything goes, right? You can pretty much do anything you want because there's no more condemnation. So the Lord explained, don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And fulfilled them, he did. He fulfilled the prophets by completing in his life, death, and resurrection all the prophecies that were made about him, either overtly or in the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. He fulfilled the ceremonial law for us by offering himself as a perfect sacrifice. He fulfilled the moral law for us by living a perfect life, and then accrediting that perfection to our account by faith. And then the Lord makes one of his truly, truly statements, which, as we have noticed in the past, means what I am about to say 
is something so wonderful that you're going to have a hard time believing it for the next 2,000 years, but it's the truth. Truly, truly, I say to you. And we've noticed that every time he says, truly, truly, I say to you, the next thing out of his mouth is one of those things that people have had trouble accepting or believing from that day to this. So what's the truly, truly statement this time? Truly, truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So just explain those two terms. The iota, the iota, is the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet. It's like a small letter I without the dot. Just a, just a little squiggle on the paper. And what it calls a dot here is, is that accent mark or a diacritical that's written above the letters in, in the Greek. Like a like the squiggly line, squiggly line over an N to make the Ñ sound in Spanish or an accent mark. We say that we believe in verbal plenary inspiration, which is to say that God inspired not just the ideas in the Bible, but the very words that were used to write it down. But here we see the Lord goes one step further. He says that the very letters, the very accent marks above the letters will not pass away from his law until everything is fulfilled. Jesus doesn't teach verbal plenary inspiration. He teaches literal inspiration, if you will. All things being fulfilled, or all things being accomplished, can be taken two ways, and both are correct. First of all, the Lord Jesus fulfilled the law for us and fulfilled the prophets as well. He fulfilled the prophecies in his life and death and resurrection. He kept the law perfectly, as we said a minute ago, fulfilling the ceremonial law, which was full of prophetic types of his sacrifice, and keeping the moral law for us as well. So all things in the law and prophets have been accomplished for us. The second way we can take that is the fulfillment of all things all things being accomplished means when Jesus returns and he brings it all to a close. There are some things in prophecy that will not be fulfilled until Jesus returns on the last day. The moral law of God is still valid, still must be kept until he returns. It must be applied in all three of its uses until the Lord brings everything to its fulfillment at his return, because we need to hear his law applied to our hearts in all three of these ways. We need God's law to continue to set limits on the wickedness of mankind and to warn us of the consequences of going the wrong way. That's the first use of the law. We need it to point out our sin and show us what needs to be fixed in our lives and drive us to the Savior. That's the second use of the law. And we still need it as the ruler, the yardstick, that tells us as Christians what fruits our faith should bear in this life as redeemed and forgiven children of God. The third use of the law. Because God's moral law is rooted in his character and God doesn't change. His moral law is not responsive to trends or opinion polls. Not so much as an iota or a dot will be changed from God's idea of the Christian life until Jesus returns. In the Catechism, the meaning of the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, we have this exchange. First petition is, hallowed be thy name. The first thing we ask God in the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. The Catechism asks the question, what does this mean? The answer, God's name is indeed holy in itself. 
but we pray in this petition that it may be hallowed also among us. We're asking God for his name to be holy. It's already holy. But we're asking him to, to see to it that his name is kept holy among us. The next question is, how is this done? The answer is this. When the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, and we as God's children lead holy lives in accordance with it. This grant us, dear Father in heaven. But whoever teaches and lives otherwise than as God's word teaches, profanes the name of God among us. From this preserve us, Heavenly Father. To keep the name of God holy is to teach and live according to his word. That is the third use of the law. There are a lot of decisions that we have to make every day. There are a lot of things that are being changed in our culture within our own lifetime. A lot of things that people have decided by popular opinion are no longer to be considered sin. Now they should be considered perfectly all right. In fact, an alternative lifestyle. Or we should no longer feel that certain behaviors are simply wrong. And we certainly shouldn't tell anyone that if they persist in that, in that particular behavior which God has condemned, that there will be consequences for it. And you can fill in the blanks. There are a number of different things that fit that category. And we have decided by opinion polls to change the definition of right and wrong and good and evil. But God doesn't change. And his moral law doesn't change. Not a dot, not an iota will pass from this law until all things have been fulfilled. And so it stands. We want to know how Christians should live we go back to the Word of God. We want to know what preachers and teachers should be teaching in our schools and in our churches. We go back to the Word of God. It hasn't changed, and it never will. What's changed is our attitude toward it, and in fact, it hasn't really changed. It's always been an attitude of rebellion. And that will never change either. Unless the word of God does its work in our hearts and shows us our sin and brings us to repentance and to faith in Jesus where we find forgiveness for our disobedience and deliverance from all those terrible consequences of our sin. And that's the promise of God. That's the gospel. The doctrine, I'm okay, you're okay. <laughs> In other words, everybody has their own reality and their own definition of reality and of, of right and wrong and, and, and good and evil. We'll never save anyone. But bringing people to repentance and faith in Jesus does bring salvation. And we see it happen all the time. We had a church in Mexico where several people said their favorite verse in the whole Bible was the one that says, and such were some of you. It says you were this, you know, the people are this way and that way, and, and they say, and, and then it says, and such were some of you, but you have been washed, you have been redeemed, you have been sanctified by the grace of God 
in Christ Jesus. And there were people who would say, that's what I was. Such were some of you. We have the same thing here. We've been redeemed, forgiven, set apart for God. God suddenly looks upon us as though we had never sinned because Jesus died for us, fulfilled the law for us, and gives us his own righteousness in God's eyes. Now we can start living like children of God because we're free. Lord Jesus, you've promised that not an iota, not a dot of your holy word will pass away until all things are accomplished. Thank you for that assurance, Lord. Awaken in our hearts a sensitivity to your Holy Spirit who reminds us of your law when we're tempted to sin, who shows us our sins and shortcomings and encourages us to flee to you for forgiveness and who works through your word to enable us who are your own beloved children, to live according to your will revealed in your word. Give us godly, faithful preachers and teachers who will never compromise the truth of your word in their teaching or in the way they live, but will make the truth of your word clear for us in all its purity until you return again for us. And Lord, let that day be soon. Amen. <clears throat> Do you know this song? We'll learn it real quick. Thy word, O Lord, like gentle dews, falls soft on hearts that pine. Lord, to thy garden ne'er refuse this heavenly balm of thine. Watered by thee, let every tree forth blossom to thy praise. By grace of thine, bear fruit divine, through all the coming days. Isn't that pretty? Let's sing that verse again, shall we? <laughs> Thy word, O oh Lord, like gentle dews, fall soft on hearts that pine. Lord, to thy garden that refuse this heavenly balm of thine. Watered by thee, let every tree forth blossom to thy praise. By grace of thine, bear fruit divine through all the coming days. Thy word is like a flaming sword, a wedge that cleaveth stone. Keen as a fire, so burns thy word and pierceth flesh and bone. Let it go forth o'er all the earth to cleanse our hearts within, to show thy power in Satan's hour and break the might of sin. Thy word a wondrous guiding star on pilgrim hearts doth rise. Leads us to God who dwell afar and makes the simple wise. Let not its light there sink in night in every spirit shine. That none may miss heaven's final bliss led by thy light divine. Will you stand and pray with me the Lord's Prayer as he taught us?
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive this blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our worship service has ended. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Mm-hmm.